Welcome to WebRTC Tips by WebRTC Ventures. I'm Aaron Syme, CEO and founder of WebRTC Ventures. In today's tip, Hector Zelaya from our team is going to talk about automating configuration for WebRTC applications. And uh, this is a really interesting presentation uh, that he will give uh, by using tools like Terraform and Ansible to build more uh, repeatable and reliable deployments and configurations of your WebRTC applications. And it's really important for a lot of reasons uh, and in helping you scale your application and in doing more reliable deployments. A lot of really interesting, this is DevOps content, but that's super important in building a WebRTC application in particular. You know, he'll talk about how this could be helpful in doing things like stun and turn servers, which are some of the things in WebRTC applications that people run into the most struggles with. So being able to build a configuration so that you could do this reliably over and over again, uh, it could be really valuable to building your WebRTC application. So without further ado, let's get to this tip by Hector Zelaya on automating configuration for your WebRTC application. So um, we're going to talk about how we can automate uh, configuration for WebRTC. One of the first things that we have to keep in mind when talking about automating configuration for WebRTC is the fact that WebRTC um, itself, it's not a solution. It's not, it's not a final product. Instead, WebRTC is a technology. It's it's a building block that you will be using along with some other building blocks to have or to build your final product, your final solution that you want uh, in order to solve this, the, the specific problem that you are trying to solve. Um, in that regard, uh, the process of taking the building blocks, taking the WebRTC and any other, uh, building block that you want to use, that process, it's a complex process. So so, so we have some level of complexity uh, to go from the pile of blocks to the beautiful parrot <laughs> or whatever, uh, whatever solution that you want to build. And the challenge here is, uh, or what you will want to, to achieve is to find a way or think of a way to overcome or reduce that complexity. Because as you know, resources are limited. So you need to find a way uh, to overcome that complexity and focus on the most important things that you want to solve. So in this regard is where automation can be helpful for your for your solution, for your process. But you, you also need to understand that it's not just a matter of uh, just clicking the button, write a bunch of scripts, and voila, you will have your uh, product already built, and, and, and you can just sit back and relax as the image, as the image is showing. So uh, you need to understand what automation can do for you. And one of the first things, uh, probably the most important, as I was mentioned, that research is something limited, is the fact that you can reduce the amount of time and efforts. Those are probably two of the most important resources in any kind of project, the time and efforts that you spend on a specific task. And if in each project, um, there, there are some tasks that can be repetitive that, that you can have them in multiple projects and they could be uh, very similar or even the same. So you can uh, reduce the amount of time and efforts that you would spend on those uh, certain repetitive tasks. So that's something that automation can help you to, to achieve. Uh, and it achieves this by providing a repeatable process. So the idea is that you can build something once and then you uh, should be able to implement it then multiple times um, using uh, one unique effort uh, for uh, building it and then just uh, taking what you have built and implement it in other um, project or, or other parts of the process. Um, 
another cool thing that you can achieve using automation is you, you, you are able to manage your configuration through virtual control. Um, it's very likely that for automating something, you will be writing scripts and those scripts are basically code that you can add into version control. You can track all the changes that you made and you can have your, uh, your you, you can have versions of your configuration that you can roll back if you require to, or or you can come back and and revisit. Um, so you you need to also think about what automation cannot do for you. You cannot automate building the whole solution or the actual solution. There's still work that needs to be uh, performed manually. Um, and the idea is that you can automate uh, what is repetitive and something that you can implement uh, without having to spend uh, too much time on it once you have it uh, built. And you can focus on the things that are strictly required to uh, solve the specific problem. Now, that's about what automation can do for you. Let's talk about the tools that we will use uh, to, 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 to automate. Uh, there are a couple of tools that we usually uh, imp implement in most of our uh, projects. Those are Terraform and Ansible. Let's just give a really quick uh, overview of, uh, of these two. So uh, Terraform is a tool that allows you to automate infrastructure. Uh, it supports multiple cloud vendors, uh, some of the most important ones, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, Azure. You can, uh, it also supports some uh, other, um, other such as you, you, you can also build or uh, yeah, build your Kubernetes resources using Terraform. Uh, we mostly use it for cloud vendors, but there's a lot of um, vendors that are supported by this tool. Uh, one cool thing about Terraform is that it's open source. So in addition to the fact that there are no additional costs on using the the, the open source uh, core of, of, the, of the product, you, you can also contribute. So if you want a, uh, a specific feature that it's probably not not, not 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 supported, if you have the research, you can actually contribute and make it available. Um, and with Terraform, you write uh, scripts, you write some, uh, you, you write the resources that you want to provision and that is, code that you write and that you can add into virtual control and achieve uh, infrastructure as code. So that's part of what uh, some, some of the things that we do with uh, Terraform. And on the other hand, we have Ansible. Ansible is uh, for configuration management. Uh, this means that uh, you're, you already have your infrastructure up and running, and now you want to install the dependencies, install any required updates, um, make sure that the specific folders that you need exist on the server, um, use templates for the configuration and put those templates on the server with the actual values that will make your uh, product to actually work. So that's Ansible. Uh, the main difference uh, with you using Ansible uh, with uh, doing manually is that you can, again, build all your list of uh, settings and all your list of dependencies and, up and apply it uh, on multiple servers at once. So that's like the, the, the nice thing about this feature. Ansible specifically, uh, I like it, and this is a personal preference, of course, uh, because it, it it's it you don't require to have a complex setup of of, of infrastructure. Uh, it, it you don't need to install any agent on the servers. Uh, it it runs on top of the, of the SSH uh, protocol, so you don't need anything additional to to to. Um, I mean, 
if you can SSH into the server, you can definitely use Ansible to apply your uh, configuration. That's what I like about it. And basically the approach that we want to follow, uh, this is a very simplified um, image, of course. We will want to use Terraform in a, in a first step to uh, provision the infrastructure. Uh, I'm using an EC2 just as an example, but we can uh, totally use something different. We can use, uh, if we talk about the AWS space, we can use ECS clusters, AKS, Elastic Beanstalk, or whatever compute uh, service you prefer, you can provision it using Terraform. And once we have uh, that piece of infrastructure running, you get your Ansible playbooks, your scripts, and you implement or uh, apply all those changes in the servers or the, the instance that you already have up and running. That's basically the approach. That's basically the uh, principle that we want to apply. So let's talk about what will we need to configure. So uh, an important piece uh, on each WebRTC solution are media servers and uh, something called the ICE framework. Those are uh, mostly the uh, pieces of, the, of your setup that you will most likely want to uh, automate. Let's hope. So let's uh, talk a little bit about each of these. So a, a media server. A media server is a piece of infrastructure that sits in, in, in the middle of, uh, of the communication between your, your uh, clients. Each client will be in charge of um, get the media streams from the device. That's the video, audio, and even the data, uh, if, if, if we talk about the data channel. And each client, each peer will take uh, those streams and will send it to the other peers. But um, while you can implement uh, uh, something called mesh, where you uh, have all the communication going uh, client to client, that could, when as as you add more clients into that mesh, things could get uh, complicated because you will need more resources to transcode, uh, to decode, and, and, and to handle uh, that much connection. So it makes sense to put something in the middle that, that uh, takes care of that. So that something in the middle, that piece of infrastructure is a, a media server. It's basically where you would uh, delegate the function of from simply routing the media streams to all the other peers to even uh, add recordings or even transcode or uh, somehow ma manipulating the streams to make it uh, do what you want. That uh, basically are the things that you can do with a media server. Uh, there are a couple of approaches for that. Uh, in the image, <laughs> if you uh, reach, uh, if you get uh, close enough, <laughs> you will see that this is a media server that it's uh, using, uh, using an approach called SFU. SFU means that all the clients will send the streams to the media server and the media server will route all the streams to the uh, client. And, each uh, client will handle multiple uh, connections. There's another approach called MCU, where again, all the clients will send their streams, but the media server uh, will, will be in charge of mixing all those streams into a unique stream that is then being sent by, by the, by the, uh, to, the, to the clients, sorry. So that's for the media server. Oh, and one thing before, all these translated into configuration. A media server is basically an instance where uh, you will install a specific software that will provide the media server capability. There are uh, multiple options to, 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 to achieve that functionality. We will explore one of them in, 
in an example in a couple of minutes. So now let's talk about the ACE, the, the, the ICE framework. The ICE framework is what enables the communication to happen in on first place. So we have in the image in the left, uh, in the left of the screen, there are two clients that want to communicate each other. Uh, you can see that both clients are behind a router, uh, behind a private network. So we can say that both clients are behind a net. Um, without any further processing, it's, uh, it's unlikely that these clients will be able to reach each other. So they first need to know how they can find the other peer. So uh, in order to do this, we have the we have the signaling process. And as part of that process, we have the exchange of ICE candidates. So an ICE candidate is, uh, uh, is a set of, uh, of an IP address and a port uh, that you can use to reach the other peer. And in order to know uh, what are all the ICE candidates that are uh, available, you, uh, each client can perform a, a, a stun request. A, a stun request is uh, basically asking an external server, hey, what is my IP address? And what is my port? How am I looking from outside of the of my network or how am i looking on on the internet so that's one part of the ice framework is the stun protocol the ability for a client to know what is its public ip address and, and and what's the port that it's being used to go out to the internet and in the image at the right it can happen that after that uh, clients make the stun request and they exchange that information with each other, when they try to reach uh, the other client, uh, we can see that the, that the client in the right is also behind a firewall. So this firewall means that there are some restrictions on that network and it's likely it could happen that uh, the first client is not able to reach uh, the second one, even knowing what is the public IP address and what's the port, because probably that port uh, doesn't allow any inbound traffic. So uh, in that regard, there's another component of the ICE framework called TURN, which, which will be in charge of relaying. Uh, it will receive the media stream and we'll then relay it to the other client using a, a setup that that will be allowed in the in the in the firewall. So that those are the two components: the stun and turn. Um, and this again making the same uh, translation that we did for the media server you will probably want to have uh, an EC2 instance if, if you're using AWS, but, uh, or more uh, generic, you will need a server where you will want to uh, install uh, uh, a specific software that will provide uh, that functionality. And same as what media server, um, that specific software needs to be installed. You will need dependencies and you will want to add configuration files. And that is where you will want to use the combination of tools that we have just mentioned. So uh, we will see a very small example of how to do this using CodeTurn, which is a software for the stun and turn functionality and Janus, which is a software for media servers. Of course, there are some other options. This is, uh, these are just uh, a couple of tools that a couple of tools that we have used in the past. So let's uh, take a look at this code. Um, first of all, this is a public repository, so you can uh, uh, go to this URL, clone the code, and you can experiment firsthand. So uh, so that you can know that I'm not giving you 
uh, any any lies here. <laughs> so you can uh, clone the repo, and I added the instructions in case you want to set up your own pair of uh, Janus and Coltern servers. Uh, you will basically need to, of, of course, you will need to have the Terraform and Ansible tools already installed. You will basically need to uh, initialize the Terraform state, um, set some configuration for the region on AWS, uh, set some variables that are required uh, in order to make this work. And then, well, you just need to apply because the code is already there. So you probably won't need to uh, spend too much time on, 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 on writing this. Once you have your new server, you can take note of the IP addresses and configure uh, your Ansible inventory, and then let's just run the the playbooks for Janus and for Culture respectively. So, this in case you want to uh, get this up and running on your own resources, let's take a look at some of the most important parts of the code. Uh, let's focus first on Terraform. In here, we have. Uh, let me make this a, a little bigger uh, hopefully that will help you to to see without making too much effort so we we will go to the main which is where all the resources are being uh, declared you can see that we're using aws on on a, a specific region you will probably like to change this um you we are using uh ubuntu ami for the operating systems in the servers uh we are because we want to keep this as simple as possible we are not building any vpc we're relying on that that uh, it's already created you can use the default one there's there is no problem with that we are selecting one public subnet and we are currently getting this from the variables now, the important pieces are um, two AWS instance. These are EC2 instance, uh, one for Janus, one for Coturn. We're using the same Ubuntu AMI. Both are relatively small uh, because this is just for uh, example purposes. We are using the public IP address. Uh, it's important to already have a, a, an SSH uh, keeper so that you can um, log in into the servers. And we are also declaring a security group to make sure that the required ports are open. We will uh, take a look into this in, in a couple of seconds. Uh, we also want to, that our servers have the same IP address across reboots. So we are allocating a pair of elastic IP address and we are assigning those IP address to the EC2 instance, and we are uh, creating the security groups. Uh, the most important things to note here are the ports 3478 for Coulter. This is where the stun requests are being made. So we are basically just enabling the stun functionality right now. Uh, and for Janus, we are opening the port 8088. Uh, which is where you will make requests to the HTTP REST API uh, uh, for the Janus API so that you can create rooms and you can create all the required resources to establish uh, communication. There are more ports that you can open. You can always reach uh, the documentation from Kotor and Janus and adapt this to, to, to what you really need. So this is... Basically, the configuration, we have the code for the configuration. If, if we have a project, we can uh, simply take this code uh, and we, we will be able to have those repetitive tasks of setting up a server, configuring, and we can focus on building the actual code, on building the actual solution that will connect to the, to the servers. And uh, we can make sure that we are... Uh, Focusing on our efforts on what it, on what it's needed to solve the specific problem. 
So now let's let's talk about the other piece. At this point, we will have the infrastructure up and running, but uh, there won't be any functionality as of right now. To do that, we will need to uh, install the software, configure it, and that's where Ansible uh, comes into play. So in Ansible, we write playbooks. Uh, 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 playbooks is a set of instructions uh, that you will want to apply on your server. The first thing is that after that we have the, the, the servers up, up and running, we will need to take note of the IP addresses and we will go into the inventory and add the information here. We are also adding an environment name. This is uh, for the variables that we want to use. Uh, we, we will look into this uh, in just a couple of seconds. Um, and if we go to each of the to each of the playbooks, we have one playbook for code for code turn, and we have one for Janus. So if we go into the code turn one, we will see that uh, we want to use the code turn set of host in the inventory. If if we have more than than the, if we have multiple Cotern Cotern instance, we will simply add uh, the the IP addresses under the the Cotern group of hosts, and this this same configuration will be applied to all to 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 the multiple servers. Um, we we are setting up the user that we want to use to log in. Uh, we are setting up that we want to be able to become a super user. And we're using an Ansible um, role from the Ansible Galaxy repository. This is our, uh, our, our role that is already made. Uh, but of course, you can write your own roles. That's no problem. And we are specifying the uh, variable file that we want to use uh, for, for, for this uh, role. And we will find a very similar structure for Janus, it, it, but the difference is, is that we're using a different role, a different Ansible role, again, from the Ansible Galaxy repository. This is one for Janus instead. And uh, both roles are easily configured using variables. So you can check the documentation for the specific roles and you will be able to see all the variables that you can modify. So if we go into the bars, you, you will find the dev uh, file. If you have multiple environments and, and you want them to have uh, different configurations, you can build multiple variable files here. And one important thing, as this is just for example purposes, uh, we are not uh, him implementing any secrets uh, or protection. For a real world project, you will definitely want to somehow encrypt or using a uh, bolt to, to, to store all your secret information. But in this case, uh, it's uh, hard coded. We don't are, we're not actually using this. So it's, it's more for um, demonstration purposes. You can see that we are configuring an authentication secret for, uh, for Cotern. We are currently disabling, disabling uh, TLS for uh, for the Cotern server, we are setting some other uh, configurations for for Janus. Uh, something about where do we want to install it? What are the, the the version of the plugins that we want to use? Some secrets for authenticating with the with the Janus servers. Also, which are the ports that we want to be available in the HTTP REST a a API plugin and the list of the files. So uh, that's all the, all that you can configure. And once you have your code uh, in the way that you want, you can, well, take, uh, take the inventory of your servers and run the Ansible playbook, and you will have your uh, Janus, your, your media server, and your stand and turn server up, up and running. And uh, that that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, it's 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 a really simple e example. Uh, of course, there's a lot of improvements that uh, can be made. Uh, we talk about adding 
some extra measurements to make sure that you don't have any secret. Uh, you can also find a uh, work on a way to have not only one EC2 instance, but have multiple and that you can somehow scale to support more users or implement a way that uh, that the that you can add a way to to monitor the traffic and be able to launch new instances uh, depending on the on the need or on the usage. It's the same principle. You will have you will use Terraform to provision the cloud resources, and then you will use, use Ansible to implement um, the the configuration, and that's it. Thank you, Hector, for sharing that WebRTC tip with us. If you're interested in building a live video application, contact us today at webrtc.ventures. Or if you just want more content like this, follow us here on YouTube and follow us also on Twitter at WebRTC Ventures.